Hello everyone. One of the terms that I mention constantly is this term anchor or restraint or external stability, all sort of saying similar things. I like the word anchor for reasons that I'll get into, but I think, or, you know, I wanted to make a video specifically uh, in terms of, you know, my intro little lecture here on anchors and anchorage because I mention it all the time and I realize that a lot of you probably haven't heard that term before and if you have, maybe you've just read about it briefly in one of the articles that I've written on it on my website. So for starters, what is an anchor? Well, if you think about what the purpose of an anchor is on a boat, people who are doing activities on a boat, let's just call it fishing for now, uh, you know, they go out in the water and as a consequence of being in the water and they want to sort of park the boat, if there's a little bit of a tide or a wave or whatever, you know, the, the, the boat will move. And, you know, when you're fishing, you ideally don't really want the boat to be moving. So what do you do? Maybe, maybe you know, the term anchor is old fashioned. I'm not a boating person, so I don't know. Maybe there's some other advanced technology, but you all will get the point, right? You throw down the anchor in the water. And the reason that you do that is so that the boat becomes fixed. And the reason that you want the boat to be fixed is because when you're fishing and you're trying to catch fish, you ideally don't want to be doing a dance on the boat um, so that you can actually, you know, pull the fish in, especially if it's a big, strong fish, maybe a shark or something like that, small shark, hopefully. Um, so the purpose of the anchor is essentially to fix the implement below you, beneath you, so, you, so that you have an ability to actually perform the task that you want, i.e. fishing. So much in the same way, anchors in the weight room are essentially these objects, these implements, these physical blocks that we can use for stability in order to accomplish tasks that we want. So for example, anchors in the lower body are especially important for reasons that maybe distinct from the upper body we can talk about another time or just an application. Um, an, example, an example of an anchor for the lower body might be, you know, getting on a leg extension, right? There's no real way to efficiently load the knee extended or knee straightened position, especially with your hips more bent than a leg extension. And the reason is because the leg extension provides pads to sit on and to lean back on. And as a consequence of sitting on a pad and leaning back on the pad, you're able to actually move your knee in such a way that you can load it with a pad, you know, the, and they call it an input pad, right? Where you're shoving against with your shins but you can actually, again, load that bone and that joint action through. So the anchors of the exercise of a leg extension are the thing that you're sitting on, the thing that you're leaning back on, and really the thing that you're pushing into, right? All of those things would not have existed had someone not actually just built that machine and taken the time to consider, okay, what are the things that I need to be able to sit on and lean into and push against to be able to accomplish this task of training my quads, right? And it's the only exercise that is able to really efficiently do that, right? Obviously you have, exercises like leg presses and split squats and um, and regular squats that train the quads a little bit differently, but there's no other exercise like a leg extension specifically, and that's specifically because, I just said specifically like 10 times, and that's because of the specific anchors of the exercise that comprise a leg extension. Now, in addition to that, you have other anchors, right? Other things that allow you to uh, uh, be held in place on a leg extension such that you can, again, accomplish the task more efficiently and more precisely. So examples of those are, you know, and I'm just kind of making this turn up, term up right now, you have like your reactionary anchors, right? So you have your initial anchors, the, the bedrock anchors, which, you know, the pads that we discussed, but then you also have these other consequences downstream that happen or that, you know, that you need to combat as a consequence of the initial constraints of the exercise. So to be very concrete with this, if I'm sitting on a leg extension and I'm trying to go through reps, try it, and, and many of you can just try this and you'll know exactly what this will feel like and, and sort of in a more descriptive experiential way uh, uh, what I'm trying to get at here. Do the leg extension without actually grabbing anything with your hands. And what you'll notice is that it becomes very, very difficult and complicated to actually perform the knee extension and the knee flexion because you're constantly getting pulled up and out of the seat. So we have these reactionary anchors, meaning the anchors that are necessary as a consequence of you applying force, not just sort of sitting passively within the uh, you know, setup of the machine, that we need to then combat to be able to actually accomplish the task. So again, we have the bedrock anchors of the seat and the pad and the input pad, right, that goes in the shins, but then as soon as we go through the motion, we need something else to hold us down as a consequence of the forces that we're trying to apply in that exercise. 
So these anchors are incredibly important because without any of them, we wouldn't be able to accomplish the task of a leg extension without, let's say, any degree of measurable, uh, you know, load in progress and, and ease of output, right? Imagine trying to do a leg extension just without one of those things that I mentioned, like you wouldn't be able to really, okay? And if you were able to, it would be so complicated for your brain and you would have so many different things to manage that you couldn't even probably call it a leg extension at that point. So this concept of anchorage, which by the way is really, you know, somewhat of a more specific spin-off of a concept that I got from Tom Purvis at RTS called restraints. Um, so I use the word restraints as well. I think anchorage is a little bit more specific and descriptive, so I use that term instead. That's a term that I um, have come to, to, you know, to think is a little bit more uh, precise in its definition. So that's what an anchor is. And I think a lot of the fitness world, a lot of the fitness realm, especially in bodybuilding, actually, I want to say not especially in bodybuilding, but especially in personal training, um, because bodybuilders are totally comfortable getting on machines and using machines. And there's still all this sort of bad mojo in the personal training space and in the rehab space around using external restraints and, and anchors, right? Anchorage. Specifically because people think that if you're touching something external and using it as stability, that that's bad, right? Uh, when in reality, what we're actually doing is we're actually just looking at the forces of the exercise and we're saying, hey, what are the forces that I'm really trying to impose? What are the forces that are my goals to interact with? And what are the forces that aren't my goals to interact with, right? So. Then we sort of get into the discussion around desired and undesired stimulus. So using the leg extension example, just to stick with the same one, you know, if I, again, if I remove the handles from that machine, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to juggle the forces on the knee, right? Knee flexing, knee extending, knee bending, knee straightening. And at the same time, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to basically pull myself down with my hip flexors and other associated tissues to be able to actually perform that exercise. Right, so the desired forces of the exercise are the knee extension and the knee flexion forces. Hopefully you're getting on a leg extension in order to train your quads, which are controlling that motion, both knee flexion and knee extension in this case. And the undesired forces are the forces of hip flexion, right? Basically, you know, you can think of that as like hip bending and, you know, holding yourself down. If I don't have the handles or if I don't grab the handles and pull myself down in such a way that I'm held down, by tissues that have a really easy time doing that, right? So, you know, if you are pulling down on the handles or rather you're pulling up on the handles and pulling yourself down into the seat, you have all of these tissues like the upper traps, you have potentially elbow flexors that have a really, really easy and safe time performing this, you know, sort of holding you down type motion in addition to your body weight, obviously, um, wherein you really don't need to spend much effort and energy performing that task. Now, an even better way to do that or to level that up would be to wear something like a seatbelt so that, that those forces for your upper body became, you know, practically non-existent. So again, the concept of anchorage really is a concept that just, and, and you know, understanding it as a concept is what allows you to interact more with the desired forces of an exercise and less with the undesired forces of an exercise. So machines versus free weights, it's not about more versus less functional, whatever the fuck that means. It's about how can you maximize the interaction of the forces that you do want to deal with and minimize the forces that you don't want to deal with, right? That's not to say that exercises that have less anchorage are bad. It's simply to say that if you're specific enough and precise enough about defining your goals, then you should also be specific about what kinds of anchors you need in that exercise be it something like a leg extension or something like a freeway squat where you actually want to challenge someone's ability to own their entire body, right? So the back squat is a fantastic example of an exercise where you practically have no anchors other than the floor to be able to interact with. So you have to manage your center of mass over your foot. And as a consequence, that's why it is really impressive when you see someone squatting a thousand pounds because they have nothing external to shove against. They have to manage all of the front to back, the side to side, the twisting forces that you don't have to manage in something like a machine. And again, this notion that machines are less functional or make you worse off from a functional perspective, whatever that means, than the free weight, less constrained, less anchored alternative is nonsensical and totally baseless as a frame of thinking. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, 
If you have any questions about this specific topic, I feel like I could talk about this topic for just hours and hours on end. I love to think about it and I love to um, find different ways to better anchor ourselves in, you know, in different exercises to accomplish our goals more specifically and more effectively. And what you realize when you get better and better at not only using these anchors, but specifically thinking of different ways to improve the degrees to which they allow you to interact with desired forces, you end up in scenarios where specifically with clients, especially when you're coaching, that exercises get way easier to teach, way easier for people to learn, way easier for people to feel more comfortable, way easier for people to repeat the skills and to get better at the skills a lot more quickly to improve their output and as a consequence, their physique and their muscular function and the way that they feel and all these things, right? So the more that we learn about anchors, even if it's for a situation where we're intentionally using less of them, the better. So hopefully that makes sense. And again, any questions, drop them below. Hope that was helpful. So I like to start off with abduction, adduction until, uh, or before I hop into the other lower body stuff. I just find that training the horizontal plane of the legs is something that is hugely important for hip health in general. So I like to start off with abduction before we go to adduction, just because this kind of sets the parameter or the range of motion for that other exercise. I find that a lot of people set the adduction machine way too wide for the mobility. They like jam themselves out into the position. So um, this is actually my third set here to failure. So I'll do three basically of everything today. Maybe more of some of the other um, stuff, but three sets on abduction and adduction before we get into the quads and hands and glutes. Also, don't feel like your feet really have to be constrained anywhere because my feet, with my amount of hip rotation, didn't really comfortably fit into the where the foot pads are. So I'm kind of just digging my heels down into, not really even digging them, but just have them on top of, you know, a little bar there. I don't have them dug into this, uh, this little foot plate here. So to set yourself up in this machine, make sure that you're actively pulling yourself out into it. And then, you know, so you should be able to, when you're in this position, you should be able to kind of lift your legs away from it because if you can't, then you're just going to kind of be jamming yourself into a position that you can't stabilize. So once you get in there, you can kind of lean back. And every single rep is basically just to return to that start position of pulling the legs out and letting them get pulled out. Again, I kind of like to be loose with the feet here. Because if you jam the feet downward, you're going to start to lose range of motion. But if you keep that intent of feet or uh, thighs rather shoving into the pad, you're going to have the exact sort of range of motion that you're supposed to have. And again, just pulling yourself into that position every single time, much in the same way that you would sort of pull yourself into the bottom of a press. All right, leg extensions. First things first, I like the pad sort of slightly below mid shin. Yeah, if I can, I'll adjust it to that point. I don't love it super low, especially not if it, it's going to creep onto the ankle at all. And uh, just getting a warm up here. In an ideal world, you would have a seat belt to hold you back and down into this, but for now, handles will do just fine. So main pointers, kneecaps pointed forward, sort of in line with where the machine wants me to move and shins or tibias are moving straight forward and backward perpendicular to this pad, right? So. Before you get into any leg extension, you sit down and you'd be like, hey, can I move my shin forward and backward? Because if you can't, then they're moving out here or across, that's no good. So what I'll probably do is 
pause reps here just because I'm going to do a, a press a little bit later on in the workout. So length and position is kind of covered. Another cue I really like for these, my main probably favorite cue, other than you know pulling myself down into the seat, is smushing the bottom side of my thigh down into the pad to initiate the motion up. Not really thinking too much about my feet. So as you fatigue, you're gonna lose range into that short position, the top of the motion first. So once you fatigue there, don't try to continue to get up there, just let the range drop. And just as a general rule of thumb, anytime that you can't achieve a range via muscular contraction of the target tissue, if you move beyond that range, you can be completely certain that what moved you there was not the target tissue. So there's no point really to continuing to move with a muscle that you're not trying to train. It doesn't make any sense. If you want to do that, go, you know, do CrossFit. So, see the leg curl. Two sets, probably. Whenever you're setting this up, just take a guess and then adjust your settings on every set. There's no point in trying to find the perfect spot to begin with. Best case scenario, you know, you're just at the same gym. You don't have to fucking do this every time. So this is pretty on the money. Main cues, points of contact here. Top of the quad. Jamming into the thigh pad. As a consequence of that, ass is getting shoved down. And my upper back is jamming into the back pad. So upper back jams back, top of the quads jam into the thigh pad, and everything else just kind of happens from there. Another thing too here is I like to maintain some degree of arch in my lower back. And I can talk about that another time and so far as the muscular relationships if anyone is interested just hit me with a comment be like i want hamstring and directors talk and we can talk about it so Again, main points of contact, thigh and the back. And uh, the reason that these handles are here is so that you can push yourself backward. Uh, there's some online buffoonery still, people saying that you should um, pull up on this. And that makes next to no sense. 
from a force perspective. So no need to pull up on it because the people that made this machine made it specifically so that you could do it correctly. So, yeah. So, seated calves. One of the things I think that people underestimate about the seated calf raise, in terms of its application relative to the standing calf raise, is even though the standing calf raise will train the gastroc, the outer calf, in a more stretched position, you have a lot more of an ability to restrain the ankle and really constrain the ankle with the seated calf, right? Because you have a direct support that you're shoving into in the knees. And that is something that cannot be overstated in terms of its degree of importance. So muscle length is one thing, but 10 out of 10 times, maybe not 10 out of 10, but the vast majority of the time, if I have the option to choose between an exercise that has more direct anchors and more stability externally versus one that maybe trains the muscle in a little bit more of a specific plane or a little bit more of a specific length, I'm going to choose the option with the restraint 10 out of 10 times because a big part of the reason that anchors are so important is because what, it, what anchors essentially do is they simplify physics equations for your brain. Right, so they give you an obvious choice in terms of recruitment for target tissues. Right, there are literally no, there's literally no other ability in a CD calf raise to move the weight upward than with your calves, right? Unless you're literally like trying to hip extend in the machine, which I've never seen before. Also, which would be very difficult to do realistically. So. Um, yeah, if you have the option between restraints and stability or a slightly better muscular position in terms of, you know, a position that may provide more tension, I would probably go with the anchored position. Just my two cents, but yeah. CB cabs, by the way, in terms of cueing and setup and all that stuff, I like to have my knees directly above my ankles, which is, you know, at hip width is really, really narrow to the machine. And then in addition to that, I like to think mostly about motion of the calcaneus bone or the heel bone in a vertical way. So I'm thinking about pulling my heel to the ground. And I'm thinking about pulling my heel up toward the ceiling. And that's basically my intent to move. And I'm not really moving toward much of the top end of the range here in terms of where I could get to in terms of just range of the joint because it's going to be a lot of motion through my foot instead of my ankle. And I think a lot of people who end up not really liking cap raises don't like them because they feel a lot of foot stuff, a lot of foot stuff that they don't want. So easy way to prevent that, two things. Number one is to make sure that the ball of your foot is fully on the platform that you're shoving into, right? You want the platform basically, this is the ball of your foot. You want it just below that point. And then in addition, you don't want to get to a point where your foot is having to sort of claw the floor. Uh, in other words, where your toes are really extending and getting smushed that way. So those three things are really the keys is narrower foot position, feet relatively straightforward, knees over the ankles directly, and then uh, balls of the feet on the platform, no excessive toe extending. It's pretty much the checklist. And then motion of the heel in tandem with just keeping your thighs shoved up against the pad. Those are really the, all the keys that you need for a good 
see the calf raise. Last exercise of the day here. Cybex leg press. My favorite of all time. You can really recline the seat so the angle of loading can be really vertical, meaning a lot of glutes. I have Dr. Magnus. And uh, because of the way the foot plate moves, which you'll see in a second, because it moves downward, it's going to load much more hip extension than the extension. So it kind of arcs upward and is a far distance from the hip and then moves downward and continues to load that plane. So hopefully you can kind of see what I meant by arcing upward and downward. And, uh, you know, generally speaking, any leg press is going to be a shit ton of quads and a shit ton of glutes if you take it to any degree of, degree of fatigue, regardless of the arcing stuff. Um, but the more that the machine arcs, the more that there will be a bias. So any sort of pendulum leg press that, like, swings upward toward you, sort of scoops up, going to be a heavy hip bias. Then any sort of machine that sort of arcs downward, a leg press, like any sort of pendulum leg press that goes like uh, the foot plate moves from high to low as it comes back, it's going to be a lot more quads. And generally speaking, the lower that you put your feet, the more quad, the higher that you put your feet, the more glute and hip as a general rule. So there are exceptions to that, depending on the constraints of the motion and whatnot and what you're cueing. But... In addition, with leg press in general, I'm not really a huge fan of people towing feet out. Um, I prefer hip width, which is fairly narrow, regardless of who you're talking about, other than, you know, IFBB pros that are like 260 plus pounds. You know, it's not like hip width changes for them, but they, just because of how much muscle mass they have, they have to use a little bit of a wider stance, but... That's kind of an exception to the rule. I generally find hip width, meaning, you know, your actual hips, not like your hips on your sides, right? Your actual hips are much narrower than we visually think. So I'm going hip width, which is, you know, for me, my feet are like this far apart. Toes are fairly straightforward. <clears throat> In addition, as far as cueing, specifically for glute leg press, but pretty much every leg press, for the most part, um, that's hip dominant, is you want to think about the way that your femur is pivoting, pivoting downward, right? So the foot is here, but this bone is moving that way. So cue the bottom of the femur to the floor as you press. And, uh, you know, rather than just arbitrarily shoving, because if you arbitrarily shove, any number of things are going to move to include, you know, your spine, if it can. Um, and I really like to lock my spine in from a cueing standpoint by cueing a little bit of chest up and just sort of gently folding that the whole time so that I can tell when I'm about to fold and whatnot. So.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.